honor of being Dean and President of uh, Vermont Law School. And I want to welcome you to our Race in the Law Conference, uh, Shades of Authority, a discussion about representation at the cross-section of the legal biome. It's a great title for that. Um, I'm not going to have the opportunity to thank every one of our wonderful speakers, but I want to thank Ray and Terry Ann, who's, where's Terry Ann wandering around, probably organizing stuff out in the hallway, um, for organizing this. We have uh, speakers that have come from far away as New York City, from my home island, Manhattan. Um, and uh, Montpelier, Waterbury, and other, other places, thank you so much for being here and joining us. Uh, there are going to be students co uh, coming from during various class times and rotating around. And if anybody hasn't told you, there are restrooms out this door, up the little ramp, and on the left. And if you prefer a gender, gender neutral restroom, you can go out the ramp down the stairs and go to our gender neutral bathrooms, which we just installed. Uh, so it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to be able to open this program on race and the law. Um, and I, I, the other person I want to thank is Dean Shirley Jefferson, who is traveling to find us some more excellent students. So that's the only reason she's not here. Um, interestingly, because we have a student who is from now, family now lives in Berlin, that I had the opportunity to visit Berlin uh, for the first time uh, since the wall came down in 1989. I had visited in 1975 and gone through Checkpoint Charlie. And uh, as all of you know, I think Berlin was a divided city from 1945 until 1989 when the wall went down. And it was the capital of the Third Reich between 1933 and 1945. It's a city with an immensely complex history, and it's also a history which is very much being owned by the city here. And Caroline will correct me if I'm wrong about anything I say in a moment. Um, and it is to, to the credit of the German government and its nonprofit and academic institutions, if you visit Berlin, that you will see a number of museums and memorials devoted to both the subject of World War II and the Cold War. And you may ask, why am I telling you about Berlin on a, opening a program on race and the law? Well, what I learned on my visit recently, this was just a month ago, and what I wanted to share as a start to today's discussion of race and the law was that the National Socialists, the Nazis as we call them and that you've probably seen in war movies, very actively and consciously and deliberately controlled, manipulated, and perverted the system of justice and the rule of law for their own political and ultimately deeply evil ends. The Nazis ended the independence of the judiciary in Germany in the mid-1930s, and the opponents of the Nazis were intimidated, beaten, silenced, imprisoned, and in many cases put to death. You're well aware of the racial policies towards the Jews and the atrocities committed against them, but what I was not fully aware of until I went to Berlin and went to some of these memorials and museums, and what I think speaks directly to our discussion of race and law today, was the explicit racial policies against gypsies, the Roma, against those with physical and mental handicaps, against homosexuals, and against people of Slavic origin who were categorized on a weird uh, uh, structure of race as subhumans. It was striking to me in learning about this that the Nazi government had been so successful in undermining judicial independence and the rule of law to further its political ends. And the lesson I took from it was, as I stood in the room that is on the site of the former Gestapo headquarters in Berlin, how important it is and how important I want to, com it is, I want to communicate to you it is to maintain the rule of law if we are to have a stable and tolerant society. Our own history in the United States includes the genocide, whether intentional or not, of the Native Americans who once occupied the river valley that we're sitting or standing in right now, the incarceration of Japanese American citizens in internment camps throughout the Western United States, 
in an ironic twist of American history, the most highly decorated regiment in World War II was the sons of the people who had, in, the Amer Japanese Americans who were interned in the camps. The Fighting 442, look it up, it's a great story. Um, and all of that history has to be viewed against a republic founded upon Thomas Jefferson's, who I'm named after, great principle that all men are created equal in which the founding documents uh, allowed for the enslavement of a population and the treatment of them as three-fifth persons. So I take great comfort and place great importance on the role of policymakers, lawyers, judges, and the justice system. And for the students in the room who are going to go on, master students as policymakers and law students to be lawyers and hopefully judges and to participate in our democratic institutions, you will all play an important role in that system and hopefully we are preparing you well for that. Courts can and do accomplish justice. They can be an impediment to justice, as we well know. But you know the immense impact of cases like Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, which outlawed um, segregation in public education. I quote from the Supreme Court decision in which the court said that separate and equal has no place. This was in 1954. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, and therefore we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of segregation complained of, deprived of equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. But it took from the end of the Civil War in 1964 until 1954 to accomplish that. I want to end on one, mentioning one other Supreme Court case, in part because it's, the conclusion to it is beautifully written. And while it doesn't relate to race specifically, it does relate to discrimination. And I'm talking about the Obergefell case of 2015, which uh, gave a rightful place to marriage equality in the United States. I feel a sense of personal pride in that because my own law firm, where I worked before I came here, uh, brought that litigation and argued it in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so 60 years after Brown v. Board of Education, and again, way too late in our history, um, Justice Kennedy's opinion on marriage equality demonstrates to me the role that courts can play um, in ensuring equality in our society and having all individuals being treated um, fairly. And I think this is just a lovely written paragraph. Justice Kennedy wrote, no union is more profound than marriage for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women, the plaintiffs, to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it. They respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. And the Court of Appeals decision was reversed. Um, I think a wonderful thing about that is not just the result, but how eloquently the Supreme Court laid out the fundamental underlying principles. Um, but I do think that law is something we fight for every single day. Justice is something we fight for every day. Equality is something we fight for every day, and I hope you will fight for it. I hope you will have fantastic discussions today with the wonderful people you have on our panels. And I think I have the pleasure at this point of turning the podium over to Professor Mark Latham. Thank you very much. Good morning. Where, where, where are my panelists? Yeah, absolutely. Come on down. So, uh, good morning, and congratulations to, to 
President uh, Ray Carrere of BALSA and the other members of BALSA for uh, t today's uh, symposium. Come on, have a seat. Okay, I'm going to go by too. And, um, and I want to also thank the, the yeah. folks who are here with us this morning uh, with, for what should be a, a wonderful uh, symposium on, on race and the law. Uh, I'm Mark Latham, oh, and I have to apologize up front because I have class this morning, so I have to dash out after my introductions, but uh, it, is, it is a privilege and honor to uh, introduce our panelists this morning. Now, um, let, let me start by telling you, well, let me share something with you. So, um, on August 4th, 2017, I turned 60 years old. You're probably wondering, uh, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, oh, before I go on, write that down. So that um, on August 4th, 2019, you can send me uh, presents. No, I don't want cards, presents, OK? Uh, scotch and uh, bourbon is, is more than is always welcome, so keep that in mind. OK. But uh, don't ask for recommendations after giving him gifts. <laughs> but after, uh, or, or upon turning 60, uh, I really started thinking about my life uh, and what I've done, what I've accomplished, what I've witnessed, and in large part because uh, my dad lived till he was 80 uh, and died shortly after his 80th birthday several years ago. Uh, and even I can do the math, right? Uh, so I'm 60, and if I uh, live as long as my dad, I got 20 years left. And now, uh, I think, 18 and a half. Uh, so uh, time's getting tight. But, uh, and one of the things I realized is that uh, I've seen some stuff, uh, as we all have, right? Uh, and, and some of it is of historical importance. Uh, for example, um, let's uh, jump on our little time machine and go back to uh, first grade. Uh, I was sitting in my uh, desk. We just got back from lunch at PBA Hearst Elementary School, and the uh, principal comes on the intercom and says that uh, school is being canceled for the rest of the day and for the rest of the week because President Kennedy had been killed in Dallas. Uh, now, as an aside, uh, even then I was really brilliant because uh, g guess what my first grade teacher's name was? Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy. Mm. And upon hearing the news, she ran up, she burst into tears and ran out of the room. And so in my brilliance, I, thought, I concluded that, oh, she must be married to the president. <laughs> and um, so I guess I wasn't the brightest bulb at her elementary school. But uh, so, so fast forward to more recent times. Uh, and I saw something that I thought would, I would never see in my lifetime. And that was the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States. Uh, and not once, but twice. So here we elected a black man as president of the United States. And I started feeling a little smug about America, right? Uh, what, a, what a wonderful place. Uh, we've certainly, as, as, as Dean McHenry mentioned, uh, we, we've had some horrible things uh, uh, happen in this country, uh, genocide uh, and uh, slavery, among other things. Uh, but, but his election told me that uh, we were starting to get it. And then shortly after that, uh, gays got the right to marry. And I thought, wow, isn't America just a wonderful, wonderful country? And then, then, bear with me. I just have to have a prop. <laughs> then this happened. And uh, how the, f oh, things I can't say. How did this happen? How did this happen? And uh, this makes me, real, or makes me realize, as I think more about my life, that one of the things about America is that issues of gender, race, uh, and, and uh, ethnicity are, uh, will always be at the core of this country. And so it's really important to talk about these issues, and uh, that's what we're going to do uh, today. Let me take this off before I throw up. Um, anyway, um, so, so with, uh, with us this morning to, to do that is uh, Kathleen Price, uh, who uh, is a criminal uh, defense attorney, also teaches at Columbia University, uh, lives in New York City, uh, and she has been involved in death penalty, penalty litigation uh, and uh, other, uh, uh, and represent other offenders who have been uh, subject to excessively harsh punishments, uh, and uh, as well as communities marginalized by poverty and chronic discrimination. And, and we're thrilled to have you here at Vermont Law School. Uh, she clerked with Justice Fred uh, L. Banks of the Mississippi Supreme Court, uh, and the bulk of her career has been spent with the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which did a really, um, a fairly recent report on uh, lyn lynching, I believe, uh, which uh, I, I just happened to stumble across and read uh, last week, which is uh, surprising. But uh, it's a dynamic uh, nonprofit law project that is widely recognized as one of the foremost human rights organizations in the United States. Uh, Ms. Price continues to litigate on behalf of individuals 
uh, including a, a case uh, for nine years here in Vermont uh, that was recently uh, resolved. Uh, but um, in addition to providing direct legal assistance, uh, she provides consultation and educational assistance to a range of activities and uh, <coughs> activists and organizations whose work challenges the despair of our system of criminal justice. Uh, and as I mentioned before, she teaches in the American Studies Department at Columbia University in New York City, <coughs> where she received her BA in 1992, and she is a graduate of Harvard Law School, uh, and, uh, in, which in 2004 awarded her it's a Gary Bellows Public Service Award. So thank you, uh, Kathleen, for joining us. Then um, the next panelist I'll introduce is Sharice uh, Price. Uh, no. Um, I'm sorry, Keisha, <laughs> Keisha Ram, um, who uh, won a seat in the Vermont House of Representatives. She is 22, 22. Uh, which is rather uh, remarkable. Uh, I can't even remember when I was 22, uh, but I certainly wasn't running for the House of Representatives. Uh, and um, in 2018, she graduated from the Harvard School, uh, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government uh, with a master's in public administration. Uh, she's worked for the city of Burlington as the civics engagement specialist and for steps to end domestic violence as the legal adv advocacy director. She's a chair of the Vermont Attorney General's Immigration Task Force, uh, there, there's no work in that field now, is there? Well, it, you have to ask the Attorney General because <laughs> he's well, holding the committee. I think there's probably plenty of work to be done in this very important field uh, since uh, we're making America great again. Uh, and, and she also serves on the boards of uh, em Emerge Vermont, the Main Street Alliance of Vermont, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, and the Vermont Natural Resources Council. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and I don't know when on earth this poor woman sleeps. Uh, then we also have with us Sandra Baird. Uh, who's an uh, attorney here in Vermont. Uh, she graduated from the University of uh, Massachusetts with a degree in uh, Bachelor's of Arts and from the University of Wisconsin in 1967 with a Master's of Arts in History. Uh, a lawyer, previous state representative, and a longtime professor at a variety of colleges in Vermont. Uh, she specialized in history, politics, law, and international relations. She's also the founder of a nonprofit that helps women and girls faced with sexual or domestic violence. This nonprofit helps by providing women with emergency financial and legal uh, support. <clears throat> uh, the fund also sponsors the Pro Se Legal Clinic for anyone who needs help getting help with the legal system. And as we know, uh, few people in Vermont or anywhere else can afford lawyers, so uh, pr pr helping Pro Se litigants is a very important part of keeping our uh, judicial system uh, functioning. Uh, she's assisted in the foundation of the first clinic to offer legal abortions in the state of Vermont and has advocated for better legislation to protect domestic uh, abuse survivors. Additionally, she's been involved in the creation and maintenance of sister city programs and study abroad programs that promote international exchange and peaceful cooperation. So thanks to all our panelists. Uh, and of course, uh, where's, where's our moderator? Come on up. <laughs> and uh, so, Terry, you are absolutely Good morning, fabulous. everyone. This is Terry Campbell. Uh, who is going to moderate this morning's session. Uh, and thank you uh, again for inviting me. And uh, I guess I have to let you skip corporations today. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. As you know already by Professor Latham, my name is Terry Ann Campbell. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Panelists, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. So we are gonna start off by allowing the panelists uh, to tell you in their own words what uh, their work involve, how they have been working in the field of the law and advocacy. So we are going to start to my far left with Kathleen Price, and she will let us know all about the great work that she's been doing. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, I first want to I, I thank you with, with real feeling. I, I, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be included in this. I am not a Vermonter. Uh, I never lived in Vermont. Um, I, as noted, practice at the Equal Justice Initiative, which is a nonprofit law office that's uh, situated in Alabama. I do, I've done principally death penalty work and other criminal justice work, but uh, primarily death penalty work, and I uh, have 
was brought into Vermont. I mean, I have passed through Vermont before, but I ended up spending time in Vermont in connection with um, a court appointment. I was appointed to represent someone who was facing the death penalty here in Vermont in the federal system and had the honor of appearing in front of uh, then Chief Judge uh, William Sessions, and then later Chief Judge Jeffrey Crawford. Um, and in the course of that uh, multi-year representation, uh, got to spend a lot of time here, and I have to say, I think that Vermont is a really wonderful place. Um, and it's, a, as an outsider, in, my, in the observation, I see an engagement of the question of community that is so much more robust and authentic than is true. It's just not like that everywhere, trust me on this. <laughs> Um, and because of that, I, I, was, I just am so pleased to be here on this mission because I think we can have a vibrant, vivid conversation and I look forward to it over the course of the day. Um, so I wanna say that I'm, I'm here on mission and I'm here to help and I'm really happy to be here. Um, that said, who am I? I'm a public interest lawyer. So I, um, I well, let me just back up a second. So to pick up on uh, the words of the dean, you know, we are facing, we are in really difficult times. It's, it's particularly for those of you that are uh, new adults, sort of young adults, this is really weird, all this stuff that's going on. And um, it, maybe not the fact that it's going on is weird, but the way we're, we're uncovering it is pretty uh, new or different. It may seem, it's AC different. It looks like, you know, it looks like what it looked like many years ago. Um, and so these are difficult times, and I want to start out with, uh, I, I want to say, you can do this. We, we can do this. Now, we have to do it, but you can do this. Um, and we are here, I sort of understand this conference is about how uh, the, the people in the room can sort of situate themselves to be effective in your own workplaces. And we're not so much talking about about the law of you know, racial bias and the law that deals with the corruption of racism. We're talking about how do, we, how do we occupy a position that allows us to get this work done, to get our world going where it needs to go. So, although I'm happy to talk about the law, I just don't think that's what I was asked to talk about. Um, that said, so I, uh, given that, I, I, like I said, you can do it and we're gonna do it. We're gonna figure it out. My example or what I, my experience that I have to bring here is as a public interest lawyer. So I, um, I did, uh, as a law student, do some work in big New York law firms, corporate type work. Um, it, it wasn't, it's, it's real work, it's good work, and it wasn't for me. I ended up going uh, into the deep south, which is where I'm from. I'm, I didn't grow up in the south, but my roots are in the south. I actually grew up in Colorado, which is not unlike Vermont. Um, but I, uh, I went to the deep south, I, I went to the South to first clerk. Um, it was kind of a fluke. I had no intention of clerking. Um, and then when I was a third year law student, uh, all of the government funding for public interest jobs just dried up with the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which is a law that nobody here needs to worry about anymore because you don't remember the before. <laughs> but, but all the funding dried up, so all the people that wanted to do public interest were looking for something. Um, and so I ended up doing a clerkship and I went to, I specifically went to state court because I knew I wanted to do criminal law and that's kind of where, that's where the action is in criminal law. I wanted to clerk for a judge who was a person of color in part because I wanted to see, I wanted to have some mentoring and how to navigate the deep south as a lawyer, as a person of color. Um, you know, again, just sort of pick up on the words of the dean, the law is, it's a language, and it's the language of power. Uh, and is with any language, you need to be mindful of what people hear when they're looking at you talking to them. And that's one of the things I wanted to learn from that clerkship, so that's kind of why I picked that. Uh, Mississippi's where my deep roots are, so I went to Mississippi. Uh, and then I went over to Alabama to start my career as a public interest lawyer. Um, so, the substance of my work took on directly questions of racial bias and, and the confrontation of its corruption. That said, um, we were dealing with that in the context of our cases, right? Um, which is a little bit different than dealing with it in the context of your life, your, your personal life, or even your workplace. And so that brings me, I, I basically want to make three points. I, I, we're gonna have a conversation, it's gonna be back and forth, so I didn't plan a long speech, but I wanna make three points uh, to sort of generate discussion uh, as we move through the day. And the first point is, um, irrespective of what your practice area is, 
uh, I think it's important that your practice be client-centered. And client-centered is an actual conscious, conscientious practice of putting in your work, like you're, you're, as a lawyer, your work is helping your clients address their legal problems with legal solutions. And there's also additional counsel that's involved always, uh, that's not always legal. But your, your principal job as a lawyer is sort of dealing with this, uh, dealing with what the law avails for people who are in some kind of trouble. Um, and you want to always bear in mind uh, what, what it is that the client is confronting that's distinct from what you are confronting in the context of that problem. This is something, I, I, the word I keep using is it's a practice, and, and I mean it and not as a law practice, I mean it in the way that like yoga is a practice. Like you, you, know, you get up every day and figure out, you know, what do I need to be conscious of that day? It's <laughs> that kind of practice. True client-centered, um, a, a true client-centered legal practice does require you to be mindful of it all the time. And I think particularly around issues of dealing with racial bias and dealing with discrimination, uh, you are going to need to do that. That's true for everybody in this room. You are going to need to uh, maintain an awareness, like a thoughtful, reflective awareness of what's going on here. I'm going to give an example in a second that's going to make this make sense if it's not making sense. But uh, what's going on here in the client's case? Like where is the corruption in the client's situation? And where is this difficult for me? Where And you, and you want to keep them separate because the... What you're doing for the client really does need to be about the client. So that's point number one. Um, uh, so then I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the example. So uh, early in my career, I was probably a two or three years into active practice. I was working on uh, a, a death penalty case that was in post-conviction. And uh, some of you all may not know, not do any criminal work, not do any habeas work. Post-conviction means he has already been convicted and sentenced to death, and that conviction and death sentence have been affirmed on direct appeal. And so you are in a stage of litigation that's about um, the kind of review that our due process uh, requires of uh, death cases. And in the course of this, one of the things you're looking at is the conduct of the trial or the defense or the, uh, the, the court-appointed lawyer. So everyone who is charged with the um, capital crime is entitled to effective assistance of counsel under the Sixth Amendment. And one of the things that we review in post-conviction is whether or not a defendant received effective assistance of counsel. And what this entails is uh, usually going to talk to the trial lawyer about what how did you deal with this case? Like, what were you thinking about when you made this choice? And what kind of investigation did you do? And what kind of limitations did you confront? Um, and in Alabama, this is an extremely contentious dynamic, usually. Every now and then, it's not contentious. But most of the times, it's incredibly contentious. Um, and this case that I was working on was out of a very rural South Alabama County, pretty classic. You know, if you have stereotypes about the South, most of them are going to uh, find some support in this county. Um, and the case itself really looked like a Faulkner novel. I mean, the my the client's family, who the client was a black man, his family had been working for the victim's family since before emancipation. They had been the family slaves, and they'd been working them in after after emancipation. It's it was. It was just this kind of weird, we don't sort of need to go into the details of the homicide, but there certainly was a homicide. Um, and it didn't really make any sense, and it was, it was a source of extreme community distress around uh, lots, of, lots of issues, including, uh, including race. And the lawyer that had been appointed to represent this guy at trial was uh, a white man, and my uh, my co-counsel on the post-conviction case was a white man. A colleague, someone who's a friend, someone I work with, I continue to work with him. And uh, the first time we went down to talk to the trial lawyer, uh, the trial lawyer, you know, like I said, it's always contentious. They feel like you're coming after them, and in some ways you are. It's a, it's a conflict that you need to be able to manage if you're gonna do this work, but that's not the subject of this panel. But the first time we went down there, the lawyer had an intensely negative reaction to me. Um, and I uh, happen to be a very emotional person, so I, you know, 
felt the negative reaction. I wasn't oblivious to it. Uh, and it was very directed. He was sort of willing to talk to my co-counsel, but he was not really willing to talk to me. Well, he wasn't willing to talk with me, if that makes sense. He wasn't willing to talk with me. Um, and we kind of got shut down pretty early. Uh, and then we were circling back to talk with him again uh, in anticipation of perhaps a deposition or getting an affidavit or something like that. And my co-counsel and I were pulling up to the guy's law office. And I were like really getting ready to go in. We'd been talking about our strategy, you know, to, to have a conversation. And I said as kind of a joke, you know, I wonder if it'd be better if I didn't go in. And I really was joking. I, I thought I was going in. And I'm reaching for the car door. And my co-counsel says to me, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that. I think you should just stay in the car. And I stayed in the car. And I raised this example as an example of many, many things. First of all, that sort of client-centered question, every legal team has got to make genuine, bona fide, strategic decisions about who deals best with which witness. That's, a, that's, that's an appropriate, that's totally appropriate. It's, it's necessary. It's effective assistance of counsel <laughs> to be thinking about that and to be mindful of the ways in which the dynamics in a in an attorney-witness relationship or operating. Um, so there's the strategy question, right? That's sort of the, what's client-centered here? What's client-centered here? There's also the aggression. It felt aggressive. I wasn't, we weren't having a conversation. I was given an instruction, right? And there's also what the popular culture now calls the microaggression, right? So there's a, there's a difference between aggression and microaggression. The microaggression is unintended, uh, the thing that left me feeling so diminished. And just to state what I think is obvious, Nobody in the car thought that I was the lesser lawyer. Like, there, there was nothing, nobody thought I wasn't smart enough to do the interview or anything like that. It really was just a, I'm just gonna call it. Um, and so I raised this example. I wanna, I, we can sort of talk about it, but I, uh, t t because to me it does raise the difference between when you're dealing with in your own interaction, again, this is not about your legal work on behalf of the client, but it's how you are navigating your working relationships and uh, situating yourself to be effective in what you're doing. It raises to me the difference between the aggression and the microaggression. And this is an important distinction to keep in mind as you move through work. The reason it's important is not because the microaggression is less significant or less painful, it's because the response is different. The, the, the useful response is different. And how you handle what happens to you in the course of your career around racial bias and around, um, again, the word that keeps, it's, it's a corruption. Racial bias is a corruption of what could be a totally functional working relationship. How you handle that is going to be as important in the outcome as what you're actually feeling. Now, first of all, you gotta be aware of what you're feeling. There's this thing where you just pretend it didn't happen. A lot of us did that for a long time. That There's that. I don't really recommend that. <laughs> it's not a good long-term strategy. But once you are actually feeling uh, being diminished or feeling the confusion, feeling the, did that, he, are, are we going to talk about this? <laughs> right? <laughs> then you are at the question of, OK, what, do, what happens next? And how do we, what is, a, what is a constructive response to this, not constructive? so that he feels better. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about constructive. We have to, well, you don't have to, but if you want to salvage the relationship, what's necessary here to do that? If we want to salvage the working relationship, and then what does the client need? Those things are, those are different investigations. So I, I'm raising that because I, I think it's important to be mindful of that. Um, okay, my last point, and I pro I'm sorry if I'm using too much time, um, is, uh, 
this is like from Oprah Magazine, like you need to know your worth, <clears throat> right? And I'm not talking about moral worth. I think you should know your moral worth, but that's not really the work of work. But you want to know if you're working in a company or you're working for someone or you're working, I'm not talking about the client, I'm talking about the employer. You need to know what it is about you that they value. And it may not be what you think they value. And it may hurt your feelings, but that's a separate thing. You need to make sure you know what it is so that you can navigate your working relationships in ways that allow you to be healthy and productive and effective. Know your worth. Um, and with that, I'm going to close with a quote from an old civil rights worker, a woman named Johnny Carr. She passed away recently. She was the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, which was the uh, activist organization that man ran the Montgomery bus boycott and worked with Dr. Martin Luther King and all of the uh, all of our sort of headliner civil rights workers from the from what we call the civil rights movement. Um, and she used to call our office the Equal Justice Initiative every now and then just to see how we were doing. That's how public interest works. People just call. <laughs> she called to see how we were doing, and she would always leave us with this quote. She said, "You know." You guys are going to be tired, tired, tired. And so you need to be brave, brave, brave. And I think if we're going to make America great again <laughs> around race and the law and using the law for what it can do for us and use ourselves for what we can do with it, we're going to, need to, we're going to be tired, tired, tired. And we're going to need to be brave, brave, brave. Isn't she wonderful, guys? Thank you so much. Moving on, we now welcome Keisha Ram. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tyrion. At least you didn't say Kesha, because there's no dollar sign, but it's Keisha. Um, Keisha. So I'll just say that, Keisha. no worries. <laughs> practice. Um, so, so you heard a little bit about the various facets of the, the things I've done. Um, I have served in the legislature, I've worked in the executive, uh, in the mayor's office in Burlington, and have worked in family court for a long time. So as I hope all of you now know, the legislature proposes, the executive disposes, and the judiciary interprets. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, just start by saying I, I didn't spend my entire 20s in the legislature not to tell it like it is. And I want to um, highlight Jameson and really thank Terry Ann. This is the second panel that I've been on on race and the law um, at Vermont Law School. But I, um, I'm really worried because that one um, was also on a Saturday morning. And it was also very lightly attended. And you're not hurting my feelings because I've been in, uh, spoken here with packed rooms. I've been on all kinds of panels and spoken here a lot. Um, but I want you to go tell your peers this. If they don't understand the intersection of race and the law, they will not be good lawyers. And they will not do <coughs> anyone a service as a policymaker. Um, so it does reflect, you know, I'm glad the dean is here. I'm glad I see other faculty. Um, but it does reflect on Vermont Law School that these have been poorly attended. Maybe it's because it's the morning. That's also not a good look because y'all got to get up and uh, both of those things <laughs> won't make you good lawyers. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, not just the Deep South. I mean, you know, this is not, oh, well, but it's okay because we're in Vermont because the disproportionate number of black men in the criminal justice system in Vermont looks a lot like Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So this is a really big problem here. So you can't say, I just want to be an environmental lawyer in Vermont and I just want to bury my head in the sand because that's not okay anymore. And so, you know, I'm hoping that the next time I'm on a panel on race and the law at Vermont Law School, I see a lot more students in here and I hope you tell all your friends because they better be here for Kaya Morris and Ebony Freedom and Tabitha Pullmore and a lot of other people who are doing a lot of unpaid work in the state um, around the law and not getting a lot of support or credit. That's my introduction. Um, no, so, <laughs> um, so, you know, in that vein, I would just say I really start, I want to thank the students who have really put this together. It's not reflecting on you, because y'all called me in the morning, made sure I was on the road, and I know how much you've, you've done to put this together. Um, when I, you know, when this really hit home for me, I, I am not a lawyer. I've been a paralegal and been around the law and took a couple classes at Harvard Law School and realized 
they're not that much smarter than anybody else, so you know, y'all are where you need to be. Um, when, when I first um, was sort of confronted with this from a, a race and the law perspective, and why it was so important was when I was a high school student, and I grew up in Los Angeles, and I was working as an intern for the Coalition for Clean Air, in fact, and we were working on the fact that it's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, uh, to breathe the air in downtown Los Angeles and thinking about cars and a lot of other things. And one of the least sexy but most important issues that we were taking on was carcinogens in dry cleaning establishments. And some of you may know, though I don't expect, that perchloroethylene is a major contaminant and when you leave uh, a dry cleaning site uh, fallow, it is often, almost always a brownfield site. And for the people that work there, it's a, a high level carcinogen that causes a lot of respiratory illness. Now, my job was not just to help get a rule passed in California that said we're going to phase out the use, use of perchloroethylene dry cleaning um, establishments in the state, but it was to talk to all the Korean immigrant community members. And why was that? They own two thirds of the dry cleaning businesses in Los Angeles County. So if we left them behind, you know, not only would we lose, they, they are, have enough political power um, to call on their, their, legisl like their legislators, their elected officials as uh, policymakers and decision makers, um, but we would be leaving a lot of people behind in that context. And so, you know, that was the first time I learned you, you really can't separate anything you're doing from equity issues and from thinking constantly about who's not at the table and who would we leave behind because that will come back to bite you at some point. So, you know, I moved to Vermont. I consider myself not a climate refugee, but a climate immigrant. Um, you know, somebody who wanted clean air and clean water and for my future children um, to grow up somewhere that I felt like they could enjoy the natural resources um, and went to the University of Vermont um, when I was a senior, I did my thesis on environmental injustice and what environmental health issues look like in the state. It's a lot of uh, sewage backup and a lack of clean drinking water in mobile home parks. Um, it is refugees who have lead in their homes and don't have the wherewithal and the language capacity to talk to their landlords. It's Superfund sites and asbestos mines where there's cancer clusters and nobody's really paying attention. And I wrote a 100-page thesis and uh, a friend of mine in the legislature said, you should introduce a bill. I said, I'm 20 years old and I am not a legislator. But um, she helped me write a bill that was now 10 years ago and um, when David Mears was, was the like, associate dean here and he said, yeah, we really should focus on that issue but just hasn't come up. Um, but a bill to focus on environmental justice issues in the state and the EPA is now coming back now. You know, you have Jenny Rushlow and others who are saying, um, you know, this is becoming a priority for the EPA, even that Vermont is one of the last states not to have an environmental justice policy. Um, I introduced that as a bill before I was a legislator, and my friend turned around and said, you'd make a great legislator. And I had no idea what that meant, but I challenged incumbents. I knocked on every door in the district. Um, including mine. Including Sandy's, who was the legislator in that district a while back and gave me great feedback and advice. And, um, I won by the largest margin of any challenger in the state that year at the age of 22. And so, thank you. So, you know, I may not have a lot to say about the intricacies of the law today, um, but I can tell you, you know, a lot about uh, what, it, what it means to, even if you're tired, to be brave and to have a lot of courage uh, in this space and, you know, to really reach out toward one another in this context because it is going to take all of us. Um, and I do hope that some of your peers get that message um, before the keynote and the, and the afternoon panel. Thanks. Now let me do a third try. Keisha, mm -hmm. I got it. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Now we're gonna move on to Sandy Baird. Thank you, and thank you for your invitation to come here to Vermont Law School, where I also have been a couple of times before. I'm a also a member of the National Lawyers Guild, and um, I would their work is very important to me, as it is to many people here at the law school, and I want to commend them for, I guess, endorsing this um, uh, panel today and for the whole day. Um, my name is Sandy Baird, and I'm from Burlington. I've lived there for a very long time. 
I did not attend law school. I'm one of those people who uh, studied the law uh, in a law office called Vermont Legal Aid, and my mentor at that time was John Dooley, who was a justice of the Supreme Court until very recently. And he was an ideal boss and an ideal mentor because he left me alone. And I was able <laughs> to uh, proceed on my own, and I passed the bar um, in 1977, and I've been a lawyer ever since. But because of my background, and also I think because I worked at Legal Aid, I was always very conscious of a couple of things about our justice system, which I think is very important to talk about. And one is that it is deeply unfair. And I don't believe that that is necessarily by intent, um, but what I see in the courtroom is not only racism, which I do see, but I also see incredible bias against poor people. And I learned that when I was uh, at Legal Aid, but I also learned it from my own life as well. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And one time, Keisha had this uh, wonderful thing happen for me in the legislature. She introduced a resolution honoring the fact that I've done so much pro bono work. And I never, you know, I was very grateful to her, but one of the things that that resolution mentioned was that I was a first generation American, and that has influenced me deeply. Of course, I'm not uh, an immigrant from uh, Latin America or from the places that we hear about today. My family, my father was born and brought up in Scotland, and so I am a first generation American, but I never even thought about it, really, and, until she did that, until that resolution was passed mentioning that fact. So I grew up in a uh, family that was an immigrant family, uh, very well, very conscious of the need for education, very conscious of class also. My father was a factory worker. He never uh, earned enough money to really support us, so I always had the uh, idea that I was going to someday have to support myself, and that's the ambition that I grew up with. And that's really why I became a lawyer. I kind of knew that I was too much of a, of a radical, frankly, politically to ever be really comfortable being hired by anybody because I always felt that those people would get mad at me eventually. And so I knew I had to be able to be my own boss. That's a key reason to become a lawyer. Because at, at the bottom, you can always hang out a shingle and at least get by, probably. Um, that was very conscious of me. I was a high school teacher. I was a professor, if you want to, I, I always feel like that's too grandiose for me, but um, I was uh, a faculty member at Burlington College for a very long time, and so I've always in my life done teaching, and uh, I am also a lawyer. But I re basically represent people who are too poor to hire lawyers, and that is both races, both white and black. I live in Burlington, and right now I do a pro se legal clinic where I see people for free from 10 to 12 every Saturday morning. And I've had people inquire about being volunteers there. People are all welcome to come. Also, people study with me there to become paralegals or even uh, lawyers. But I'm very conscious when I go in the courtroom, and I do still go in the courtroom, I'm very conscious of the need for lawyers for poor people. I don't know how you make a living at that exactly. I haven't been wildly successful at that. However, that is the real need of our legal system. There is huge class and race inequality um, in, our, uh, in our courtrooms, and that's how I see that the court is not, I wouldn't say not fair, because I'm not certain it is the court system's intent to have people unable to really rep that represent themselves or to hire a lawyer. But that is the real problem that I, I see in the courtroom. I do see more and more, because Burlington is vastly changing. When I first arrived in Vermont in 1968, after uh, being in graduate school, I got a master's degree at the University of Wisconsin, which really was, at that time, an incredible education. I cut my political teeth on the anti-war movement at Wisconsin with the student occupation of buildings, with um, all these students speaking up, frankly, for the Vietnamese, saying that this was an unconscionable war against a poor, a poor country far away in Asia. It was a racist war, and that was how my consciousness about politics really grew. 
But that, and that consciousness turned over also um, when I came here and I became a lawyer. I really did vow to myself that I would represent people who were just unable to manage the court system in one way or another. So that's why I think we should all be looking for that injustice um, and to try to cure it. I'll just mention also in the court, courts, I believe that we forget also that the courts can be, I go to family court all the time, and in the family court I represent, because Burlington is changing, I represent a lot of immigrant people who now live in Burlington and refugees. I see probably in my clinic on Saturday mornings, most people who come to me are poor, all poor, and a lot, lately a lot of people of color, particularly from Africa. I see um, many, many Somali women, and I think that we all have to be not only aware of racism against people of color, but also women in particular. I represented recently a woman, a Somali woman, and I believe I was the first, she was, the first woman from that community to get a civil divorce and win custody of her children. She was married to a high-placed Somali man in that community, and she uh, had to divorce him because of physical abuse. She was shunned by her community because of that, because she was taking power in her own life. She had five children, and so it became a hotly contested custody battle. I was very, very nervous about this case because I recognized that she was alone in her community in seeking the help of secular, put it that way, courts. In that community, um, men alone can get a divorce, not women. And they get those divorces from a, a, a high-placed religious leader who simply accepts the male's uh, statements, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and then the woman is basically divorced and on her own, often without her kids. So this was a very, very important case. And I recognized two things about the case. One, that um, she needed incredible support emotionally. I couldn't agree with Ms. Price more that you always have to put yourself in the client's shoes, and you have to devote yourself to her or his interest. Absolutely devote yourself. It really has to come first. And in a lot of ways, you have to then put yourself in the position of the other in a lot of ways. And in that way, you become, she becomes less than others. She becomes incredibly important to you to see the world from her perspective. Anyway, so the, it went forward hotly contested. Uh, she needed incredible emotional support. She needed uh, to have a lawyer, absolutely she needed to have a lawyer more than anything else. A person who understood not only her culture, but also the law itself. And it was an incredible battle with kids being taken back and forth and, um, and and it, it was very stressful, actually, for me. It went on for two years, I believe, but I became, she became, we did succeed in getting her a divorce and also getting custody of her children, which is unheard of, I believe, uh, for many women in that culture. However, she was shunned by the community. So I'm emphasizing that, in, in particularly in Burlington, there are problems of class in our courts problems of class that we have to understand. We have to understand when we go in that courtroom, we're representing people who probably would not have any knowledge of the law or any help with it, um, and, and we have to really put ourselves in their heads and really, really devote yourself to that person in a lot of ways. So I end with that, that the main injustice I see, and what I hope that you all understand is that when is that our our class system in this country is deeply and our race system is deeply affected in our justice system and i would commend you all for studying the law because you know what when you're a lawyer 
you have a certain amount of power. And I hope you, and you really do. I always say, I'm glad I'm a lawyer, because when I call up people, they generally call me back. Because I'm a lawyer, not because of me, but because I'm a lawyer and they get a little worried if they don't call <laughs> you back. So um, I would commend you all for becoming lawyers. It's a great profession. I'm one of the few people who really like lawyers. Um, and I, I don't mean here in this room. Everybody likes lawyers here in this room. But there are many people in society that are too afraid of them really to like them very much. So, um, and I would commend you all to be lawyers, but remember that there are a lot of people out there who need our help um, and our devotion. So with that, I will close and invite you all to come to the clinic sometime and see the kind of work that we're doing. By the way, we have no grants, and I'll tell you why. No grants at all, because the grants that I would have applied for were connected mainly with the government, and the government would have these rules that you can't see undocumented people. I, and, I, and you can't. At legal aid, if a person comes and says that they're undocumented, you're not supposed to see them. So in other words, I'm pretty much on my own. So I need all of your help, OK? Thank you. I told you guys that you were in for a special treat. So. Uh, now, I have a few questions that were submitted by a few 1Ls. Should I say their names? <laughs> and um, these 1Ls are women of color. And so the first question that I think segues beautifully into what all of our three panelists have said is, uh, was submitted by Amanda West, she's a 1L from California. Uh, what do you think needs to change in order to make our legal field more diverse? Mm. What do you think needs to change in order to make our legal field more diverse? You wanna go? Well, <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. I think that legal education should be cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that would help a lot. Um, that I think, um, you know, there, are, it, there aren't a lot of lawyers of color. And so I think people that are imagining what they could be don't necessarily think about becoming a lawyer. So I do think that uh, people who are lawyers of color do have a, a bit of an obligation to go and you know, represent, like do, do work, doing work in communities will bring you into communities, will bring your, pre you know, bring your, people, make people aware of the possibility, but there's, you know, you do need to do some, some outreach. Um, so I think that, I think if legal education were more affordable and that uh, I think that it's incumbent upon us to, to do uh, recruitment, I mean, recruiting people to become lawyers. And with that, uh, how, how important does mentorship play? What importance do you think that mentorship plays in that whole uh, scenario or setting up people for being more involved? In oh, I think it's very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part, of, that's part of the outreach is, you know, if someone expresses an interest or is already sort of making moves toward becoming a lawyer, then, mm -hmm. then you need to bring people along. I mean, there are, I, I went to law school with people who were like third generation lawyers and not people of color, but the, the stuff that they already knew how to do intellectually, mm -hmm. just because they've been kind of doing it at the dinner table, it's not, it's not rocket science being a lawyer, but it is a thing. It's not. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it, I, it is a, it is a thing. Like it's mm -hmm. not, it's not like other kinds of thinking. And so I think if you've mm -hmm. already been doing that kind of, right. you know, point counterpoint pairing at the dinner table just coming along like that you would be your your adjustment to what you're doing as a lawyer would be a little bit smoother so i do think that mentorship is very important um i couldn't agree more uh ab about miss price what she said as i said i was a four-year clerk and the vermont's the only place in the union i believe that allows that i'm not advertising that because i realize i'm at a law school and that the law school needs students um, but and they do and it's important that we have law schools and um, it's probably a um, 
I wouldn't say a better way to be educated to be a lawyer, but it's a very d good way to become a lawyer. And the four-year clerkship is not uh, available to all. It is available to anybody, really, but it is much more difficult to do it on your own than to be at law school. And at a law school, of course, you have the um, privilege of having wonderful professors to teach you and to get you through a legal education. But there is a cheaper way to do it, which is the four-year clerkship. However, it's only available in Vermont, the only state in the union. Um, and so uh, that's one way. But I absolutely agree that we need cheaper legal education. We need people that are poor people, people of color, to be able to become lawyers. We absolutely need that. And we need people who are uh, uh, low income to become lawyers because they understand what that means in this society and how difficult it is for a low income person to survive even in this society. So absolutely need cheaper uh, legal education. And also we need, I think, a program of mentorship for people who are um, interested in becoming lawyers. I couldn't agree with you more. Although John Dooley had a certain hands-off attitude about me, which I really do appreciate. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, he provided a wonderful example of how to be a lawyer. And I, I'm gr very grateful to him for that. I just want to add, um, I was really glad when I was at the Harvard Kennedy School to see that Harvard Law School took the lead in removing the LSAT as a requirement for going uh, to law school. <laughs> yep. Um, and that actually made me think of going for <laughs> once. Um, but, you know, I think that's, I remember thinking a lot about going to law school. I'm you should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm coming from the perspective of someone who said, you know, this seems to be the logical path to get into mm -hmm. politics and do all kinds of other things. I'm grateful in Vermont that we have one of the lowest, not to insult you all, but I'm grateful we have one of the lowest proportion of lawyers in the legislature in Vermont. Not because lawyers aren't great, but when they overwhelm the system, you're just not getting diversity of thought. So we have farmers on our agriculture committee and teachers on our education committee, and, and that's generally a good thing. Um, but I will say, you know, when I took some classes over at Harvard Law School, I, t uh, I don't know if you took Gerald Frug's class because he's ancient and he's been teaching since uh, 79. Um, and Moreau Weinberger took his class and said it's amazing, local government law. Um, you know, I went over and I was taking that class and um, I, I was thinking maybe I will go to law school. And I come into the building and they're having some kind of end of the first week drinking party mm -hmm. and I thought they were high school students like I was overwhelmed like I, I, I told my friend I'm like I'm sorry I have to go there's like a high school group here doing something crazy and they were all eating pizza and drinking and they were incredibly young and you know I say that because when we got into class they were petrified to say anything the teacher would say you know Jimmy talk about a, a city where you run into strangers and he would like, Jimmy would shut down and he couldn't answer the question and somebody else would, uh, New York City? Yeah, great, like let's move on. And it was very, you know, people were just frightened of the wrong answer. At, when, at some of the best schools in the country, people are scared to get the wrong answer. And I don't think that's always, you know, the best training to be in the world. And yet, I say all that because these are all students who thought, you know, I'm from some small town in Pennsylvania. I don't really want to go back there, but I'll get an apartment in, in Philadelphia. I'll, I'll go back there sometimes and I'll run for office and I have so many friends who have, who have money that I'll be you know, in Congress in no time. And that's kind of who's running the country right now. And I think that's a lot of what's wrong with it. So you know, I all I'm gonna say is I would implore to you that yes, it needs to be a diverse field because these are the people who have the power in our judicial system, our, our legislative system, and often the executive. Um, and the question is how much value are you adding to the world? And I think there's a lot of people of color who look at those kinds of institutions and say, I'm, I need to go somewhere where I'm gonna come out and have a lot of value that I add to the world. And if I'm saddled with debt, and you know, didn't feel like I got what I needed and was, was feeling really disconnected from my peers who were very high income and came from really different worlds, um, you know, they might leave feeling defeated. And that, frankly, has happened to a lot of my friends of color coming out of law school. So I hope that doesn't happen to you all and you, you have mentors and allies and friends if that is starting to happen to you. Um, but you know, I, I certainly look back and I feel pretty good um, about 
about my decision uh, to go straight into the legislature to work in the legal field without being a lawyer. So just know you're not always tied to, you know, uh, I know you, you probably will all have some debt when you come out, but you're not, you don't have to go into the law at the end of the day. Um, if you uh, want to make a difference in the world, you can also, you know, run for the legislature, do nonprofit work, um, serve the public interest without practicing in the courtroom. Great. Can I add something? Sure. I don't know how the Go right is. ahead. I will say this, though, as a lifelong public interest lawyer, you do want to watch the money. Like, don't. Yeah. I, yeah. I do actually yeah. think. Um, mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is just a personal example. I didn't, I didn't have a roommate in law school. I thought that I couldn't deal with a roommate. Do you understand how much I wish I had just gotten a roommate? Why? <laughs> Why? Because I... Is it cheaper? Yeah, it would have cut my living expenses. Yeah. So yeah. it would make yeah. my living expenses so yeah. much smaller, and I would have borrowed less money. And I do actually think yeah. that really is going to bear down on you at some exactly. point in ways that you can't... I think, okay... This dovetails on what you were saying about experience. I actually think everybody should have a lot of experience of something in life before going into law school. I think it makes for a better lawyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lawyering is is judgment, and you if you haven't broken a lease before or done something stupid, I'm not saying something violent. I'm just saying done something a little stupid, and understood like what the facts can look like. You are bringing you are limited in how you can review the fact, how you can bring that judgment to bear as a lawyer. That said. Um, if you, if you uh, go into law school young, you don't realize how much this, you don't realize what it's going to look like to be looking at that debt at, you know, 39, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, I really want another kid, or, or whatever, or I have a kid who needs, who needs a special school or something, and, you know, if I didn't have to make this stupid loan payment, because if I didn't mm -hmm. borrow all that money. Right. So I, I, I don't mean to whine here, but I do actually think, I remember being pretty cavalier about uh, debt as a law student, and I would discourage that for it. It's going to really confine your ability to do work, to do the scope right. of work that you might want to do, and it will certainly confine your ability to do work on behalf of the poor, That's which I absolutely echo right. everything you're saying. Yeah, that, right. you know, lawyering for poor people is one, it's some of the most important work that you can do at any level, at any strata, if you, you know, take that on with this degree. But you can't, I, she's absolutely right. You're gonna end up pretty poor yourself, probably. So, to watch the money. To watch so the money. Watch. Yeah, right. Go to school. Come. To, it's worth it. I'm not saying it's not worth it, but mm -hmm. but do the math. Don't do that imaginary about the math. <laughs> so we've got some great advice: budget, how to budget your money, how to be a good law student, how to be a good young lawyer. Just great advice. So and I this is going to move us into the next question. When, uh, you know, as women, as women of color, of uh, people in general, how in the, in, that are in the law and in advocacy, um, Ashley Harper from New Jersey asked, uh, what methods of self-care do you incorporate in your routine? Well, I like this question. I, I, just started doing self-care recently so <laughs> it's an active question for me and I wish I'd started doing it sooner so I feel like as whoever the students are in the room figure out what self-care works and start mm -hmm. doing it right away yeah. <laughs> you'll be a better lawyer for it um but I don't I, I, uh, I the main thing is uh, that self-care the, the biggest thing about self-care is that it's not the same thing as pampering and I think people wish that it was as easy as like getting a pedicure or something Self-care really means knowing yourself and knowing uh, when you need to take a day off. You know what I'm saying? Like, it took me many, you know, working, working in, in, in marginalized communities, you can work all the time. The work is right. not going to stop. Right. And it took me many years to realize that I didn't need to be reading cases while I'm, like, trying to go to sleep. It's messing up my sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to stop. And, and I, I'm a food person, so I was always someone who ate a good dinner. I, I, was, I took care of myself in that way. But I remember, you know, all the work that I would plan to do after dinner. And at some point, I realized this is really kind of not good for your life. You need to, 
you need to you need some rest. That's what I call that rest. I've read about this, um, and and rest actually allows you to do stuff that you can't do if you're not rested. Um, and you know, again, it's easier. You recognize it easier as you get older because the uh, it becomes catastrophic. You know what I mean? It, or it seems catastrophic. Like you feel so handicapped by how weak you are, tired, which wasn't true when you were 25. But that said, that, that's what I think. Self care is learning the piece of yourself, like your body will tell you when it need, what it needs, you have to be able to hear it. Um, and this could be about, I actually really do think it's about rest for 100% of people, but it's often about exercise, it can be about, um, about uh, the other part of your brain, like you know, you use the analytical part to do, or the, um, even the strategic work, it's very draining, right? But there may be other, you know, you may like to read novels, you know, make sure you do that. I, uh, but uh, again, I think the key to self-care is uh, the know thyself part. It's like admitting the truth about uh, what balance is for you. Now, if what the truth is about what balance is for you is that you can only work like four or five hours a day, it's not the profession for you. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, but so you want to know that. If you're, not, if, you're, if you're not someone who can sort of, you know, really kind of work hard, it's, it's, not, it's, not, that, it's not the profession. If you're not someone, if people get on your nerves all the time, you don't want to work with people clients. You, you yeah. <laughs> I like people, and most of my clients are are crazy people. Like I, you know, I, I don't mind that. It, it, I don't. I enjoy the investigation, but I also it doesn't. People don't bother me. I prefer people. But if people, if you are someone who is aggravated by people, you have to work with institutional clients. You can't. You can't bring that to the. You can't try to get them to stop bothering you. So that's, it's, it's, I think that's, that's my self-care thing, is the key is to know the truth about you. I would say three quick things. You know, one, um, dovetailing on that, um, I have gotten eight hours of sleep every night from college till now. I have run for office six times, including statewide office, and my other 16 hours would not be productive if I did not sleep. Now, that does get interrupted by my second um, point of self-care, which is I have a three-and-a-half-month-old puppy, um, and she mm -hmm. got up at four in the morning last night. Um, so I really try to keep that eight hours, but I know it's hard when you have other influences. Um, if some of you need self-care, she's in the car right now waiting, <laughs> um, and she's really cute. And um, the third thing I would say, I'm especially... She cold? What? She's a little cold, but she has blankets, don't worry. She, if I left her at home, she would be like <coughs> upset, really upset, because um, she's just little. So we're, I'm gonna go back out soon. Um, my third thing is speci probably especially for the young people, but now they're saying it's really a, an all age thing. Get off social media sometimes. Yeah. Really, really take a break. Um, they're not relationships. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, um, when Ambassador Samantha Power, uh, UN Ambassador Samantha Power came to speak at um, University of Vermont, our, our commencement one year, she said something that stuck with me. She said, don't judge your insides by someone else's outsides. And she was talking about, you know, a meeting she had had where she was in the White House for the first time and feeling really discombobulated, spilled some water in the Oval Office. Um, but it really, really applies in the social media world. You know, I have, I, I, you don't even realize that you post a picture of your puppy, you post a picture of your trip to Hawaii, and all of a sudden your friends are texting you like, well, so, seems like you're living your best life, like you must be really great. And you realize you're not really checking in with each other anymore. You're just sort of seeing images of people at their most happy or most thoughtful or whatever. Um, and especially, you know, for those of you who are coming up in a world that's markedly different in terms of how we engage um, and how we connect with one another, you will be more successful in your pursuits if you can still connect with people in person, look them in the eye, you know, and have a real conversation and understand emotionally in, in, in an emotional intelligence kind of way what's going on with their with uh, their their face and their body language and um, you know in, in especially running for office and in, in, in all facets of life people say 90 percent of how we communicate is body language and we're losing the ability to talk to each other literally by just doing it over social media um, I would say at what, um, how I, I don't know if it's called relax or rest, but my, I try, I can't help, I guess, but follow my main passion. My main passion is changing society. That happens a little bit through a legal practice, but it also happens to me and it makes me feel 
totally engaged is to be engaged in politics, I guess. Not necessarily, I did, I was a state legislator for a while and replaced actually by this wonderful woman next to me who I don't say that she replaced me because of course she is her own person as we can see and she has been, done a wonderful job there. But my main passion is really to change society and so I engage in many grassroots level, as I mentioned, activities that I think I'm contributing to making uh, the world, not just this tiny part of it, the world a little bit better place. That's not restful, it's interesting though. So I would say as a lifelong uh, advice is to follow your passion and that provides at least a sense of total engagement in this in this world which is very important to me and it's nourishing mm -hmm. huh? Thank it's you nourishing so mm -hmm. it's very nourishing yes and a lot of times you get beaten up and you lose a lot of struggles nevertheless it has always convinced me to keep going and that's even at my age that's very important mm -hmm. I hope you guys are taking notes. <laughs> so one final question. Uh, this one comes from uh, Amanda West again from California. Um, and she asks, um, as an aspiring woman lawyer, in what ways have you or, or as women lawyers or as pioneer women, women lawyers, what ways um, are there to benefit from working with fee with male advocates or allies in the in advancing the legal, your legal or advocacy career? So, how, as I guess, as female lawyers, as women in the law and in advocacy. Um, how important is it for uh, males or the uh, persons of the opposite gender to uh, what role can they play or do they play in advocating more for equality, fairness as it relates to uh, gender, et cetera, and race? I mean, so first of all, you, 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 yeah. know, you can't advance without male mentors and friends. I mean, this is a male dominated space. All of them are. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just always go for the women in your life and say they're probably going to be better mentors automatically because we're both women, because you might be closing yourself off to a lot of really crucial relationships. Um, you know, the other thing that I think sometimes you have to spell out for anybody in your life who you need, need support and help from in your next steps is that there's a really big difference between being a mentor and a sponsor. And this is a distinction that's made by a professor named Robert Livingston at the Kennedy School who does a lot of business consulting as well with Fortune 500 companies. And he, you know, mentorship is when you're with that person, you're showing them the ropes, you're showing them where to get everything, how to do the work, and you know, you're helping them be better at their job. Sponsorship is when that person's not in the room and you're saying they would be the best person uh, for this new project or this initiative. And so often it's when women aren't in the room or particularly women of color aren't in the room, um, you know, that those conversations are had. And so it's, the, you know, it's the meeting before the meeting where it's really easy to get picked over and for somebody who even loves you and thinks of you as someone they're mentoring to not think of you for that big, bold new step and to, to, to say your name out loud to a group of people who wouldn't think of you otherwise. You always want to be thought of uh, when people are in the room if you're not in the room with them. Um, you know, so I would just say that in, in addition, um, when we had a male speaker of the House in the legislature, which was a majority of my time in the legislature, um, he filled the appropriations committee with women. Nine out of 11 members were women. And people said, that's, you know, a, a bit much, don't you think? Um, and he said, you know what? Women don't grandstand. They don't hold the budget process up for their vanity project. They just write the budget because they know that's food in children's mouths, that's environmental protections for the state. They really just get the work done. So that's you know what I would say about um, demonstrating your value and making it so that you can have men who are you know often your biggest champions and the biggest mm -hmm. champions of having um, women around them who literally do the work. I would say get allies wherever you can, men or women, or neither. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, ladies and gentlemen, swans, faculty, uh, guests, uh, you have heard it from Kath attorney Kathleen Price. You have heard it from uh, Keisha Ram, legislator. You've heard it from attorney Sandra Beard. We are gonna open the floor uh, with a short Q&A and we, I think we can go until 11.30, and then we'll break for lunch, uh, where we'll have the screening of um, a documentary, and then we'll come back with a keynote speaker. Thank you, guys. No questions, it's a law school. <laughs> If, if I can start with a question from one of our uh, folks watching from home. Um, an anonymous student asks, I'm a recent graduate of uh, VLS turning in on live stream. In my experience, uh, taking on pro bono cases and in working at the South Royalton Legal Clinic, I can very much identify with the NLG panelist's story about our client seeking a divorce, needing a lot of emotional su support as well. Uh, my question is, in helping my pro bono clients, I find that they often need support in ways uh, that often don't fall under the strict label of legal services, and I struggle in trying to balance how much I should help in ways that are perhaps more like social work, and how much I should focus my time on my client's legal issues. Uh, the other complicating factor, though, is often it is hard to find services for my clients that might uh, complement my work. Uh, particularly with English language services. Do you have any advice on how to try and strike a balance? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, Keisha reminds me that one of the ways that I have done and uh, worked in the past is that I've worked with other people in other specialties, uh, including social workers, and I've worked with women helping battered women a lot, and along with that, and with Keisha, and with other people who are more. Uh, emotionally, I wouldn't say emotionally, they're more in tuned, I guess, than lawyers usually are, are. Remember that lawyers are people also, and they have their own emotions, and they are able to help sometimes, but the primary responsibility of a lawyer is to get people through their legal problems, and they're often two different things. Um, I had a, a case yesterday trying to represent a grandmother who had been full custodian of her grandson, and the, her son stepped forward and really snatched the boy away from her. So she was in the middle of a huge emotional crisis, not only about the grandson, but about her own son, who was basically uh, mentally at least abusing his mother. And I had to deal with that in court, and the grandmother kept on saying, they're gonna grant the father full custody, and she was really distraught about it, and I said, I had to say, that's the way the law works. Grandparents don't have any real rights to custody or to visitation. So I had to really tell her the truth about the law. It would have been very helpful to me to have someone there, however, to counsel her, help her through the emotional uh, crisis that she was in. So that's how I think people should work together with other professionals. I also um, want to respond to that. I think I'm so glad that this question came in because I, 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 I think it's important. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that this lawyer is noticing this aspect of the work. That what is what the lawyer? I think it was a man, but I, I'm not sure why I thought that. But it, that he was called upon to provide to provide a, a kind of support that is outside of the core of his legal assistance and is hard. Um, and it is hard, and mm -hmm. I know this from, in my work, I, the, f the information that I need to get to do my job is, is really emotional information, right. and it requires right. a level of um, being, in, being in proximity to a person having what is probably a very difficult experience, both at that time and just sort of the long haul of what I'm gonna demand of this person. Um, and I think what I wanna say is, you asked how to strike a balance and I don't have the answer to that. Um, but I do want to say that for most people, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, you think, you think when they're sort of having, when they're emoting, they're bringing the emotions to the table in, in addition to the facts, you think they want you to solve that part of the problem. And 99% of the time, they want you to be with them while they do that. 
And so doing that is really giving mm -hmm. that person what they need, which is to be, um, to be heard for what is true, which is, you know, this hurts, this is frustrating, this is, I'm ashamed of this. Whatever the emotion is, whatever the thing that's making you uncomfortable, they wish that they wouldn't say that. They, you know what I mean? They, they can feel that. But when you stay with them in it, it's just like any other relationship. Someone that is okay with you acting, you know, emoting, you don't need them to give you any advice. You need them to stand there with you through it. And doing that is really, it's doing your job in the best way. And so I'm not, like, don't beat yourself up for not being able to fix that part of it. Make it feel better, make it feel less painful. You, that's not, that isn't how life works, really. But being with them in it is being in community or what, what Brian Stevenson would call proximity. Be willing to be uncomfortable. You said something about this, too. Like, being willing to be uncomfortable so that the client can get what they need, mm -hmm. that is, that is, it's not, you don't learn that in law school. You learn that in your home training, right? But it is, it is the gift that a lawyer can bring to this particular kind of work. I always think of it being on their side, regardless of anything else, that you're on their side. Help me in the door to ask you to talk some more about EJI. Is it okay to ask you to talk some more about EJI? Sure. Would you please? Oh. I don't have a specific. I mean, it's, it's something I followed, and I actually got down to Montgomery last year. So I'm just, you know, a little bit more about, because that. Well, EJI, I mean, it's a wonderful place, and I sometimes feel like I just kind of tripped into it. Um, I kind of landed there as a 24-year-old. <laughs> it is a law project. Uh, you know, we do direct legal representation of people, indigent people, who need help. Most of the people that we represent are uh, facing death sentences, but we also represent people, juveniles who are facing uh, life without parole or, quite frankly, I just any excessive sentence. Um, we do impact litigation and uh, reform work that flows out of the criminal justice uh, system. I think our recent uh, project is about amplifying the ways in which racial bias and anti-poverty bias have really distorted and corrupted uh, our systems of justice and our notions of justice. It's yeah. not just our systems of justice, but our, is our concept yeah. of what Justice is, and you know, I so appreciated you bringing up the 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 aspect of of poverty and and the contempt that our systems mm -hmm. have for people who don't have money, and you know, the whole system is driven by people who don't can't imagine not having forty dollars. Like it's really, it's kind of stunning. So that uh, it, uh, so. In addition to our direct representation and our impact litigation, we are also in the middle of this mission to really bring, to, as I said, to amplify um, sort of the truth about the experience of the poor and other marginalized people historically and at the present and how the sort of the history carries into the present. And we've done that through um, a focus, uh, Professor Latham discussed uh, a recent lynching report. You know, we just opened a memorial uh, to the victims of uh, racial terror lynchings in the United States, which mm -hmm. includes, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people, mm -hmm. and the memorial—it's a—it's an extraordinary memorial, and I recommend everybody travel to visit it as a way to um, get a sense of what uh, a particular kind of race-based trauma that is, you know, a core part of our country and certainly the South and and the North as well. I mean, it, the North was not unimpacted by lynching. Um, but uh, that's something that we're doing to sort of, to drive a particular kind of discourse. You know, the belief, this is true for all, it's true in your individual personal relationships and it's also true in our community relationship that what you can't face, you cannot fix. Um, and you won't heal anything that you won't let yourself feel. And we've got a lot of trauma in this country mm -hmm. around not just race and racism, but around race and the law. We have a lot of trauma around it. And if we don't talk about it, except in the reactive stance, we're not going to get past it. We're not going to get, we're not going to, get to what's possible in this new world. So that's CJI. Hi, Hi, my name is Phoenix Myers. Um, I just first want to say I found all of your stories very inspiring. So thank you so much for coming here. 
Um, none of you have like exactly addressed what uh, I have a question about, but you probably through passing might have some um, knowledge. So specifically, I'm interested more in like juveniles, um, mm -hmm. poor juveniles, minority juveniles, um, especially like young men of color who get caught up in the system when they're very young. Have you guys heard or do you know about any innovative uh, programs that are um, starting for the youth or how you think that in society we should approach you know, handling juveniles and how to keep them out of the system you know, preemptively? I'll tell you one, one thing I've seen recently. Um, there's a lot of homeless juveniles in Burlington, and that is a total crisis. Um, Burlington and all of us should devote ourselves to homes first. I, I actually uh, took in a homeless boy in my house, a boy of color, for the past year, and he lived in my house, and he left, he left on his own. He was a very troubled boy, but he'd been on the streets. And I cannot imagine a society that leaves juveniles without a home. He had no money, no job, and he was basically looking for a house every night of his life, between the time he was maybe 16 and 18. He just turned 18. So I would say that that's a real problem that is not being addressed. As far as I can tell, it's not being addressed anywhere. We have a shelter in Burlington for kids, but they have this kind of weather, um, and it's, it to me is barbaric. So I don't know how to solve it. I can't, obviously no one person can solve it, but it's got to be something that we commit our society to, is the whole problem of homelessness. And I don't think there's any solutions at this point that are adequate. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for an absolute disaster. This kid was on the streets when he was uh, probably 16, booted out of a, a foster care situation because I think he probably had been, a, a, I hate to say this, but probably a bit of a thief. So he, but he had nothing. Deserted by both parents, mother had disappeared, father was in jail. And unable to care for him. He wasn't a particularly nice kid because of that experience, but there's no way in hell that he should have been on the streets of Burlington, Vermont in this kind of weather. Not, no way. And it's just a sign to me that this society has really gone the wrong way. I will say this. Um, I'm really uh, impressed with and proud to be part of the ACLU's uh, Restorative Justice Coalition in the schools. Um, I don't know if it's happening across the country, probably in other states even more so than Vermont, but here in Vermont, Jay Diaz is leading that at the ACLU, if you haven't had him come here. Um, and working with him, I introduced legislation to uh, limit the use of suspension and expulsion, which is a school to prison pipeline mechanism. Um, and in our broad partnership, and I understand teachers are asked to do a lot and with, with very little, um, but we couldn't even agree on language to uh, get rid of the use of expulsion for children under eight years old in Vermont. So, um, you know, we have a lot of work to yeah. do in this state. Most states are having this conversation in the legislature because it is, uh, you know, if we're not thinking about how to create alternatives for, you know, and we were just talking about nonviolent behaviors um, that were getting kids suspended and expelled in our schools. And we know in Vermont and probably around the country that it's largely kids with disabilities and students of color that are highly disproportionately facing suspension and, and expulsion. And, and definitely, and, and definitely, definitely boys. boys. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And if you'll uh, forgive me, my phone is slow, but I have another <laughs> uh, internet question from somebody watching from their desk. Um, how can we create or join opportunities within groups, discussions, or, or events that are normally at odds with our schedules? Also, how can we begin to change this to open these types of spaces to more people? Thank you. I'm not sure what that means. How can we create or join opportunity within groups that are normally at odds with our own schedules or agendas? Also, how can we begin to change this 
uh, to open these types of spaces to more people. Mm. I do have a thought on that. I'm not certain I understand his question. But I have for a long time uh, recommended within at least Burlington, but everywhere, the preservation of public spaces that are truly public. There's a, uh, uh, our mayor in Burlington is actually, I hate to say this, Keisha, because she worked for him, um, but, uh, what? I'm used to it now. Uh, but public spaces are incredibly important where people can exchange ideas, where people in, can in, uh, engage in study and in conversation. Keisha said something very important about social media. Social media prevents face-to-face -face conversation. And I don't believe you can really have democracy without that, without getting to know your neighbors personally. Um, and to have, I do a discussion group with people, senior citizens in Richmond, at the Richmond Library every Thursday morning, and I call it the state of the world, where we gather at the library and discuss this crazy country. And it is very, very valuable. That, and it's a public space. I don't have to rent it. I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to insure it. I can have conversations with people who care deeply about our country and the direction it's going. So that would be my recommendation, is to always preserve public space. Mm. Always. Mm. I. I kind of brought it up, so I don't know y'all's schedules and when you usually have events, and I'm sure there are a million things going on all the time. The people that come to mind when I think about that question are Aaron Jacobson and Art Edersheim, who mm -hmm. do so much to be around the state. And I've always asked Aaron, especially, um, you know, when I, we, we serve on the Immigration Task Force together, do you have students who want to be involved, who want to come to attorney general meetings and have these conversations? And, you know, she's always wary of taking students away from their busy schedules as well. And the person who, you know, really, really um, is in my heart when I think about that question is Cheryl Hanna. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some of you here may not know Cheryl Hanna except for some plaques around the campus, but, um, you know, she was an incredible, um, you know, advocate who did radio programs, who came to the legislature, mm -hmm. who brought students out, who always encouraged students to run for office. Um, it's a huge, huge loss, but, you know, just gr grieving that while also honoring her legacy by really thinking about how much you can extend around the state um, and, and reach out to professors who are trying to do the same thing. Um, you know, go, go back and listen to some of her VPR commentaries and some videos from the legislature because she was a real force in the state and she helped a lot of people in Vermont understand the law. Right. And that was an incredible public service. I just wanted to add to the question. Um, um, I think that uh, it would take Vermont Law School making this kind of topic a priority and opening up their pocketbook or, or what have you, um, affording more resources for people who don't live in South Royalton with the other 10 people um, <laughs> to go and, and provide transportation to get down here um, and to spend some real time um, advertising and connecting and also making it a part of um, curricula for students here to actually connect um, and have to go out and, and, and be with, um, you know, besides vis just visiting the prisons, but what about before the prisons, um, going to the school where um, young um, black and brown kids are being suspended and expelled and then sent to the, um, through the criminal justice since um, system. So um, that's my quick um, um, add on is that I believe that if the law school was serious enough to make this type of thing a priority, I would even be available to assist. <laughs> just, a, just a very quick to underline or whatever, whatever he said, it always comes back to public transportation mm -hmm. yeah. in Vermont. I'm sure the students would love some of that, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a question here? Yeah. <laughs> so is there 
are no more questions, I'd like to now invite uh, Ms. Mariam Hinson onto the podium. She has a little thing to say to our panelists. Good afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. On behalf of Vermont Law School, Black Law Student Association, Latin American and Caribbean Law School Association, sorry, Law Student Association, Women's Law Group, and National Lawyers Guild, I would like to give you a little oh. token of appreciation. Um, first, Sandra Baird. Sorry, guys, we didn't rehearse this part. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. All right. We could do all of us. Yeah. Next is for Keisha Ram. Keisha. It's Keisha. I've been practicing. <laughs> Kathleen Price. Thanks again to our morning panelists. We invite Professor Joseph Brennan to come and introduce our lunchtime documentary entitled The Woman's List. And we're going to break for an hour for lunch. So please feel free to replenish yourselves and get ready for our afternoon session. Professor Brennan.